Hey folks, so today's video is going to be about the uh, European Copyright Directive for the digital single market. Um, I wasn't originally going to talk about this topic because it's uh, rather complicated and there's still a lot to come into focus uh, right about now. So, um, and, and I'm going to get some things wrong. I'm just going to, I'm going to put that right out there right at the beginning of this video. Uh, because it is very complex. I mean, everything to do with the European Union is very complex, and there are a lot of unknowns in this equation, so it's certainly not a straightforward thing. But I'm going to try and muddle through some of my thoughts on this, because just so many of you have, have asked me to do a video on it, but uh, it's probably uh, not going to be a particularly smooth and even coherent video. But I'm going to share a few thoughts and a few uh, a few predictions, I guess, about what this means, uh, both for us as internet users, but also what it could mean for the uh, the free software uh, community as well, uh, because I think there could be some uh, some interesting dimensions here. So, um, I'm also going to link to a particular Register article, an article from the Register uh, that I think talks about it in a reasonably sort of. Um, uh, like a non-hysterical way, because I think a lot of people are throwing around this, oh, memes are going to get banned, and oh, there'll be content ID on every single thing that we do now. And I, uh, well, don't think that that's necessarily likely to happen. Okay, so I'm going to start off with what I think might, or what the future might look like over the next two years in regards to the um, copyright directive here. So it has just passed the European Parliament, uh, and I believe now that it goes through a, a vote of the member states, which then will hand it over for the member states to implement individually. Now, this is where the comes into play here, because each of these member states then have to weave this copyright directive in with their existing business laws, and they can interpret this directive in any number of ways. They can interpret it in a very soft way, or they can interpret it in a very brutal way. And also... Uh, you know, no, no country in the European Union, Brexit or no Brexit in regards to the United Kingdom, like we're not an island, like economically speaking, of course, we, we are an island in that regard. But you know what I mean, like um, uh, Brexit or no Brexit, we don't suddenly move to the other side of the world completely forgetting and leaving uh, the continent of Europe behind, like we are still uh, world citizens, of course, regardless of whatever happens. And um, that could mean that surrounding com uh, countries, uh, for any country in the European Union or in Europe in general, um, could be impacted by how how neighbouring countries um, apply the uh, the copyright directive as well and how that's enforced. Because uh, it could very well be the case that countries, uh, companies operating in Europe will just adhere to the strictest possible guidelines uh, and use that as a template for operating throughout Europe. So like I say, like I think anyone that claims to know what they're talking about or claims to know what the future holds it, it, are surely full of bullshit, to be honest, because it, it, over the next two years, we will see all of this taking shape really for the, for the first time. And, and, you know, it could not be as bad as we think. It could be worse than we think. Uh, I don't know. Now, there are some glimmers of hope in this, uh, it, but there are also some causes for concern. Now, they've renumbered the articles that are often commonly referred to, so I'm going to refer to the two main controversial articles, or the main articles that most people have concern for, as the link tax article and the upload filter uh, article, uh, despite the fact that those names might not necessarily be truly accurate of what they represent. You guys will know what I mean. This is just for communicative purposes. So the link tax purpose, I've got to say, is the one that I probably understand the least, because the idea behind it is that if you aggregate someone else's written work on another site, so the core example that I see most people using is Google Reader, uh, then there will have to be or there could be license feeds paid to the original copyright owner or copyright holder of that content. So apparently anything other than very short extracts will then require the licensing ramifications of this to, to come into effect. I don't know what very short extracts 
is. Uh, could that mean, for example, a title and a link? Does it mean a title and the first paragraph and a link? Uh, and again, this is, of course, how the member states can interpret this. Um, now, of course, Google massively opposed this because this is going to affect Google Reader and a lot of the other Google services here. In fact, uh, it does seem that Google have been struck particularly hard more than most in regards to this legislation. So for those of you that are just right, right anti-Google and want to see Google get kicked in the nuts a little bit, I, I mean, you can, you know, like there are some positives out of this for you guys, I guess. But there is an explicit uh, mention that linking is still fine. So how this then has an impact on um, how content is shared and displayed? Well, it might very well be, and this is a per perhaps a, a more optimistic view on it, that rather than just have those big Twitter cards that you see whenever someone posts a link into Twitter and it sort of folds out into a big card with a, a picture and then a, a little bit of extract of text to know where you're going, it might just maintain the link and, uh, and then you just carry on hardly the end of the world and um, it would then force you to go into the article itself to read it rather than just glance a headline and, and carry on. I know that that's an argument used in favour of it before but I don't know if whether or not that will come into fruition. So you know it, it might you know it, it, it might not necessarily be as, as, as bad as a lot of people are saying it. I mean again it might be. I apologise for sitting on the fence I know the internet doesn't take too kindly to these kind of uh, fence sitting types of opinions that I'm uh, exhibiting today but to be honest I mean the attitude that I tend to take towards these kind of things because this is not the first threat that we've seen to content on the internet and it certainly won't be the last but my my overall attitude is is adapt or die the link tax uh, is completely uh, like it's a complete unknown really in regards to that um, and, and, and yeah, it could conceivably be something of a problem, but it also um, might not necessarily, it might be a storm in a teacup. Honestly, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to be the uh, nothing to see here, calm down everybody chap in this discussion, but uh, I mean, are we going to get hysterical about something that we have no idea how it's going to, to impact our lives? I'll talk a little bit about how it might affect free software and creative commons later on down the line, but there are provisions in the copyright directive that actually protect, protect uh, public domain works. Like, uh, And there are people that say if it wasn't for these two particularly controversial articles within it, that um, most people would be in full support of this uh, uh, of this overall directive. So, I mean, it is interesting. And again, it's very complicated. It's very easy to, to latch onto like little bits of information that we get given and to make those little bits of information representative of the entirety of the directive. But um, this is one of the reasons I don't like making this video. This is one of the reasons I didn't want to make this video is because uh, not only is this situation so much more complicated than, than most people uh, want to interpret it as, but uh, there are also so many unknowns and also the fact that most people talking about it, probably including myself, are going to be wrong about a number of issues within here um, because it's constant, you know, like there there is constant reinterpretations and um, new precedents being set and all this kind of stuff. You know, we're, we're still very much in the wilderness here and, um, um, and so, you know, the, I don't know, like, I mean, a lot, I see a lot of people getting hysterical, but uh, we we don't know what to get hysterical about right now. Um, it, it all you know, and and of course, uh, to be honest, when it comes to uh, governments in general um, uh, trying to legislate the internet, I, I gotta say, in many ways, I consider the battle lost here in the UK at least. Uh, well, I think maybe the the final nail in the coffin was the Investigatory Powers Act, but long before that. Um, you know, the, I, I think we've sort of lost our internet before then. Um, uh, and, and maybe it might have had something to do with the fact that so much content on the internet nowadays is reasonably like uh, it's it's multimedia centric, whereas maybe 15 years ago, it, it, there was a lot more text based content, which was a lot more like it changed the overall culture of it, it changed the overall dynamic, it made it a more uh, thoughtful place. Um, and it also made it a place where, you know, any old server can host some text. But now that people come to expect videos and podcasts and all this kind of stuff, that hosting has become a prerogative of 
of high powered uh, infrastructure. And th then when you bring that dimension into it, you inevitably bring big companies into it because they're the companies that can scale these things effectively. Um, so, yeah, I've got to be honest, like there's nothing they can do to us that hasn't already been done to screw us over. I think we've been screwed a long time ago. And um, and, and so uh, to me, I guess the real strength of a lot of it is we've got to find the control that we can uh, on, on a on a on a, a deeper, more basic level. And maybe that means uh, focusing a lot more on on the offline things that we can do with the computer as well. But again i uh, like i say like the 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 uk government has certainly uh passed its fair share of terrible legislation when it comes to the internet in general um it's you know it's highly controlled it's highly monitored um so this to me is like i mean even the even some of the worst um interpretations of it they strike me as just being the order of the day i've i've gotten used to this crap long time ago a long time ago so you know, um, it's this. It, this is this is not only not a surprise; it's just fully expected. So, anyway, um, so so uh, <laughs> so anyway, I the the link tax in particular. I don't know how this will have a ramification from the perspective of people who make Creative Commons content and public domain stuff. And these videos that I make on YouTube, they're licensed under Creative Commons too. So uh, I'm not going to be chasing after anyone that uses excerpts of my content, that's for sure. Um, but um, the thing is, uh, and I think the Register article actually covers this quite interestingly as well, or at least it covers it in terms of a quote, is that there are, might very well be many institutions that actually will look upon Creative Commons a little bit more favorably as a result uh, of, of uh, you know, opening up their content, releasing the licenses on their content, or face uh, obscurity as well. And of course, that could be seen as uh, coercive on one hand, but it could also be seen as uh, looking at Creative Commons and the free uh, and open source uh, software and content as, um, as a way out, as a way to set us free, um, which is uh, particularly, which is a potential avenue here as well. Now, just before I go into that further, uh, I'm also going to be covering the upload uh, filters article as well. Now, upload filters are not specifically mentioned in this uh, particular directive. It's just that a lot of people are saying, well, if big companies like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter have to be responsible for the content that's uploaded by their users, they're going to have to employ either huge armies of human moderators, which will cost a lot of money, and that money's obviously got to come from somewhere, or they're going to have to um, employ the use of uh, automated content filters. Now, let's um, forget right offhand that YouTube already use the most advanced and extensive content filters going uh, today. And yes, there are some problems with them. All things considered, and this is only one person's anecdotal uh, perspective, but out of the hundreds of videos that I put up here on this channel, I don't believe any of them have been falsely claimed by the content ID system. Uh, certainly there are none as of right now, so any claims that were falsely claimed maybe a few years ago that I've completely forgotten about have since been dropped or, or appealed and then um, dropped as a result of the appeal. Now, I'm not saying that the content ID system in question is perfect. There are plenty of examples, plenty of examples that will prove um, prove me wrong on, on that side of things. But... Um, and there are many people that do say that it's not suitable for public and widespread use right about now. So there are challenges and problems associated with this, and it will again be interesting to see how the legal, what the legal approach to the best efforts of automated uh, content ID systems will be in this regard. Um, but the actual crux of the idea, the idea that a content platform, a hosting platform effectively, is responsible for the legality of the content uploaded by its users. I'll be honest, I don't think that's necessarily an entirely 100% flawed concept as many people on the internet would have you believe. Um, I know that in terms of the practicality of it all, the practicality that YouTube must take responsibility for 
all of the content uploaded to its platform like it just can't do that and content id sort of tries the best it can but it regularly drops the ball um as well is uh is is a problem on a, on a practical level but um if you like owned a, a pub or a bar and you allowed people to um to to gamble without a license in there or to organize crimes within that pub like you would be held responsible for allowing that to happen as well this isn't like a completely out of left field never unheard of idea before and i think this is where i find a great deal of strength in PeerTube and the federated platforms as well. So for example, the videos that I make here, they also get hosted up on ShareTube and I'll put a link to ShareTube down in the description below. But with uh, ShareTube, in order to post videos to that platform, you have to know the person who runs the platform. You have to be invited. Now, once you upload the videos, they can then get federated out into the, the Fediverse. You can, you can subscribe to it using RSS feeds, another PeerTube instance, a Mastodon account, all that kind of stuff. So the videos are distributed, but in order to host them on that platform, you have to be invited. Now, that's not the case with all PeerTube instances. But if I was running a PeerTube instance, I would be very squeamish about just letting random people on the internet upload uh, video content to my server unchecked. Like to me, that does strike me as, well, asking for trouble, if I'm completely honest. Now, maybe there, there are people out there that are braver than I and kudos to them. But, um, but when it comes to ShareTube in particular, I like the idea that we have a small community of content creators that uh, sort of work together and and have each other's backs. And I think that that's really kind of nice. And I think that it's worthwhile. And, um, and I think that that is a good alternative. It's a good approach to the problem of uh, that kind of legal responsibility. We don't have to employ the use of content filters. We can uh, we can apply the, employ the use of humans and people and communities. Um, so I think when it does come to the the worst parts of the copyright directive for the digital single market, uh, I think the free software world and Creative Commons have the tools to survive and endure this. Um, maybe even the worst of this as well. So... Um, it could very well be the case that Google is the hardest hit by this. And I'm perhaps not as big a hater of Google as certainly some of the folks on this channel. But then again, Google have have basically helped me when other uh, any other institutions haven't. Like they've allowed me to monetize my videos. That's made a really big and important difference in my life. They've allowed me to host my videos without having to pay something which I wouldn't be, have been able to afford to do otherwise. The only reason I can host on ShareTube is because people um, decidedly want to support my content. Like it's, it is very much a, a gift, a generosity, something which I am eternally grateful for. But I am not entitled to post these videos on ShareTube. I post these videos on ShareTube because people want to see my content in that space. And for that, I'm, I'm flattered and humbled and grateful. Um, so this could also mean a resurgence for self-hosting, like people taking personal responsibility for the content they put out online. And it could mean that we we see more people self-hosting, um, and that would be a good thing. That would, re that would decentralize the internet a lot more and allow us to take responsibility for our own content that we do put up there. I think that Creative Commons uh, content, something which I sincerely want to support, could get the inside track against a lot of hev heavy licenses that might then hold back a lot of proprietary software or a lot of proprietary content. Um, and, and again, I think that this might possibly not be the worst thing in the world for us. I am by no means a supporter in these articles. I like to see a free and open internet as possible. But... Um, but I think that when it comes to who's going to have to endure the most, I think the free and open source software world, I think the world of Creative Commons might very well like, be one of the groups that actually managed to survive this with minimal scarring. Of course, I could be entirely wrong. There are, of course, examples of public domain content being... Uh, swept up in content ID filters because a 
corporate entity has decided to embed public domain works into its uh, you know, into its content, and then those public domain works then get swept up in content ID systems. That, of course, is a problem here. Um, and I think maybe the biggest problem might be that the copyright def directive is badly enforced or is uh, enforced falsely, um, which might also be something that could be a problem as well. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how Google throws its weight around now, because Google are definitely one of the bigger uh, people to lose out of this equation. So, um, but Google are too big to go away. Like they ain't going to pull out of Europe. They have clout and they have ballast, and there are people who now depend on them as well. That's not a good thing. But you look at, for example, AMP, the Accelerated Mobile Pages, uh, which is effectively Google trying to uh, own and um, colonize the mobile web. But websites that don't use the AMP framework uh, could very well, and I think they might even, it might even already be occurring, that they find themselves further down search engine rankings. And this could be a real uh, problem. So it'll be interesting to see if Google uses that kind of clout in order to fight against the uh, copyright directives for the digital single market here. Um, so yeah, uh, is it the end of the world? Probably not. Um, in the UK, we have already plenty of horrible laws regarding the internet. This is just more of them. But I think some glimmer of hope out of this might be that the world of free software, public domain, and even Creative Commons might be able to offer something um, that can survive this. I could, of course, be completely wrong, and I'm probably going to hear about why I'm wrong in great uh, unfiltered detail down in the comments section below, so feel free to do that. But thank you guys very much for watching. Uh, like I said, I didn't want to make this video because uh, it's complicated. There are so many unknowns. Um, and until we know how the EU member states are going to enforce these rules, um, like, th what's there to say? What's there to say? Like, the, the language of the amendments is bizarre and, and clunky and uh, impractical, and it, it, it seems to seems to be open for an incredibly wide amount of interpretation so and has to be weaved within existing laws of the member states themselves so what does this mean i mean to be honest i've managed to make shrugging muscle shoulders last a lot longer a video than i thought it would do but uh but thank you guys very much for watching and um um uh, yeah i i think i've i think i've said everything that i need to say i could very well revise my opinion, maybe even the moment I upload my video. I uh, I certainly don't feel too rooted in uh, anything that I've said here today. I'm really just sort of chewing over some thoughts, if I'm completely honest. We don't know until it hits us, unfortunately. So maybe the hysteria is warranted, maybe it's not. Um, I guess it'll be interesting to, to find out. But um, thank you guys very much for watching. That's about it from me today. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.